Hello, 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 and thank you for checking out The Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. Today, I've got a special guest. He's a friend, he's a client, and he's a straight-up MFing hustler. He started off in education uh, because it was kind of a safe bet, and then he moved on into uh, building his own catering company, which has been around for about 10 years. So uh, I have got a lot of respect for this guy. Please welcome from KG Fair Catering and Events, this is Josh Griffiths. So uh, welcome to the show, Josh. How you doing? Thanks a lot. Jim. Glad glad <laughs> to be here. Uh, I guess <laughs> I guess during these times, but yes, happy to be doing yeah. something. Yeah, you're pretty you're pretty styled out though. You you got this house in Vermont. You're like I see your Instagram. I see what you're baking over there. That's that's I got to stay busy. If I don't stay busy, I go uh, a little insane. Well, most of us are like baking basic loaves of something, but you're like distilling. You're making maple syrup. Like what what kind of projects do you have working on? Well, yeah, distilling, if we were allowed to be doing it, I'd be doing it every day. Uh, secretly, yes, distilling as much as possible, considering getting a rotovap so we can do like more re- refract. What do you call it? Refractory? That way it's not illegal. Uh, Refracting oh, spirits. Rectification? Rectification. Don't go um, into I- the idea that I'm a, an educator after I can't even talk about rectification. But yes, <laughs> rectifying spirits, making maple syrup. Just sold a ton of cutting boards, like I, redoing the basement. Yes, I have to. I'm insane. I don't like to sleep. Wow, you're that's that's so you're like a maker. Like you, you're. I mean, like you had a back. Tell us about your before we get into that. Tell us about your background in education. Well, I I ended up as a young New Yorker doing everything kind of like the the typical way, which I shouldn't have. I graduated col- I graduated high school and went right to college and I was not really ready for any kind of education or college. I was just like had so much energy. It wasn't for me. Hated every step of the way, but it's what you did, right? Like you were lucky to get into college, you went to it and you did it. So throughout college I was just a doer. I had to always be doing something other than my homework because I don't think I did much of that in college. Um after college, came out with a job, you know, working in retail and bars and restaurants, basically just staying busy, always picking up a shift, always doing something to do with food, beverage, hospitality on the side. But then I had a kid at a very young age, and all of a sudden, that took up all of my time. So education seemed like a good fit back then for me. Like in that post 9-11 world, I was able to get a job in education, went back, got two masters in it, and became a special education teacher. A uh, great outlet for my energy, great outlet for, you know, I felt like connected with these kids. I felt really motivated to um, kind of like be a good influence, right? to be a part of something bigger than yourself, right? The dream is always that you'll be walking around town in New York, which is my city, and that somewhere down the road, you're going to turn a corner and someone will be like, Mr. Griffiths, oh man, that used to be my teacher, <laughs> right? Like That used to bring such a, a smile to my face. Um, I kind of continued on that path of like safety and security, uh, which, you know, teaching is an incredibly difficult job to get up every day. We're kind of in the teaching mode right now um, of every day you have to bring it, you bring your best, you have to redo things over and over again for people to get it. And to be a teacher is an incredibly special and difficult thing. Um, But for me, it really gave me as a family person, as someone who had to support a family, that steady income, which I really appreciated when I had young kids, um, I went through that. People asked me, will you go back to school for um, leadership and school building leadership? I really enjoyed the social human aspect to leadership, right? Understanding the frameworks of leadership, right? Structural leadership, leading by uh, personality, all these different like structures that go into really organizing I'm kind of a people person. If you can't tell, I don't think you've gotten to speak yet. <laughs> uh, it's my job to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but going through that process, I kind of fell in love with the idea 
of higher education administration, the idea of swinging a pendulum and figuring out the smallest changes you can make in a large institution to have the biggest impact, right? That that one piece really rode me through this second master's. It was like looking at a, an organization and saying, look, if I make this tiny adjustment over here, it's going to impact the students or the teachers or the families so immensely over here on the post side of it that the fact that I took so much time to analyze the data and realize that it's just a little tweak here that could make such a big impact really got me excited. Um, and this, and, and you're talking about talking about developing curriculum. Anything from curriculum to putting the right teacher in a certain classroom to think about things you don't think about, like how much work and effort goes into making classes. If you have mm-hmm. four classes in a in a public school, you've got a hundred kids. So any combination of those kids could screw up a year, could make a year, right? So you really put a lot of effort into the planning. And when you plan, you know, it's like, what's the, what's the, um, Eagle Scouts or Boy Scouts, you know, planning Mm -hmm. and preparation. It's, it's really true. And when you work with people and, and kind of organize in that way, you can really build things and you can see the impact of your decisions kind of playing out. I really enjoyed it. But uh, to be totally honest, I couldn't live off of it. Even at, even as an assistant principal of one of the best schools in New York state, running a family, like as the, as the breadwinner of a family in New York city with three children, mm-hmm. I couldn't afford to live in New York. Right. That's so, so that's so awful. It's it's such an important job. I mean, it's it really is like this like generational like thing that is that we just put so little emphasis and so little resources into what are like our most important resources. It's it's wild. Well, don't that even get been... me started on that because I start thinking about like conspiracy theories and like how the people how education inherently has been like keeping down generations and generations of people like you really go to weird places and you want to be the voice that will you want to invest your entire life to this goal and you could come out the other side of it making huge changes but you could come out of it as a lonely old person who's created great change for everyone but my family would have been without a father you know what i mean Mm -hmm. because i would have i could easily go that route and be like fighting to the end over some changes I mean, you saw it in COVID with de Blasio and he was like, essentially, you know, it was almost not that I'm going to get political, but he was essentially like, you know, schools are like daycare for a lot of families in New York. Like there's, they can't go to work if they can't, their kids can't go to school and there's no place for them to eat. So it's a real kind of not slap in the face to teachers, but at the same time, teachers have to almost be reinvigorated by the idea that they're spending a lot more time with kids often than families are. Right. They really have the ability to give forth so much towards children and teach them how to think. Like I always felt as a teacher, it was my job not to teach you how I think, but to teach yourself how to think, like teach the kids how to think so they can decide for themselves. I don't care if one of my students becomes a Republican or a Democrat. I just want them to figure it out for themselves. So as a teacher, I felt it was always my responsibility never to bring my opinions to the table. Right. Hmm. So I didn't tell them how I dealt with things politically. I didn't tell them. They never saw that I had tattoos. Like I always covered everything up because I wanted to be as vanilla as possible. So I could always get back to the basics of like, how do you think? Like, what do you think about that? Why do you feel that way? Let's talk about that. Right always bringing it to like your goal. And it's the same in hospitality. Your goal is to impart the ability for the people around you to think for themselves, but respectfully and with value and care for one another. Well, that's some uh, definitely some deep thinking there. I'm curious how that, um, what the transition was like to entrepreneurship and to building your own businesses and brands and how that, that kind of deep thinking applied to building those businesses. Well, deep thinking is a push for me. I've always been kind of a like, it's on my brain, so I do it kind of guy. Even within um, 
education. I think one little secret is I always worked cooking jobs. I always worked bartending jobs. Even as an assistant principal, I was doing all of this stuff on the side. And that kind of got me excited. Like I, I wanted to go back to a trade school and teach kids entrepreneurialism because I wanted to show that most of it. And I think you and I may like, I love Gary V. I think he's an inspiration. I find him like super interesting. I could listen to him all day. But he basically tells you everything to do. He doesn't get down to the nitty gritty and he's not like holding your hand. But it's totally true that you can tell people everything they need to do. They're still not going to do it. Whereas I'm like mm -hmm. the absolute reverse. I'm going to do everything. And then once I've done it, I'm going to be like, yeah, that sucked. I didn't like that. You know what I mean? Like I just get it done. Whether I do it well or I do it horribly, I'm doing it. And no one's That's ever going to pay me for something that I don't get done. That's one of the things that I wish I had learned early on is that uh, like Gary Vee is, is a very much a done is better than perfect kind of guy. Just get it out. Just get it out. Just get out. Just push content, push content. doesn't matter if it's good. doesn't matter if it's bad. It's, it just matters that it's authentic. And I wish that that was kind of something that I was, uh, was instilled in me a lot earlier because, you know, I've owned my own business since 2010 and, um, and you know, it, the only reason it took me that long was because I was afraid that I would make mistakes well, newsflash, you're yeah. going to make mistakes. It's part of it. And it actually, like, I wouldn't trust somebody who didn't make mistakes, who didn't like fail forward. Now making mistakes twice makes me angry. Um, but, uh, but once is, is totally fine. So tell me about some of your mistakes, you know, when you first got into it. Well, I think the hardest part for me, and it still is, is that in the business that we're in, like catering events, mixology and cooking and all of these other things, it's like everything else, right? Um, you get paid to do something that you you say you're going to do, right? You bring to the client this idea and the client's like, I love that idea. Now do it. Sometimes you've never done those ideas. Sometimes you're just talking from the experience that you have. And then you have to now that someone's saying, yeah, here's the money. Now go do it. You have to execute. And I think the fear that I still have of, or insecurity that I still have in everything, but it also drives me to succeed is that I sometimes feel like faking it till I make it a little bit. Like I'm getting it done. I'm totally doing it. I told you I'd turn a bread sculpture into a computer for an IBM event and I'm doing it. It's just that it's not as functional as I originally thought it would be, you know? And I do think that, that after working with clients, clients, Pete business is our biggest thing. And I think it's because they know that when they talk to us, we're going to give it our all. We're not going to just slough it off to something else. We're going to give it everything. We're going to bring our best game. And you know, whenever you've had something done by us, KG Fair, or any endeavor that I've been involved with, we're going to bring value. And that value is something that I th think everyone sees through. It's like, damn, they really went for it. Yeah, and I, but a failure. I, yeah, I think that's so important. Um, you know, a lot of people don't put a lot of um, enough value into just nurturing their existing client base when they should be, you know, following up and saying, "Hey, we're here, we're here." And just obviously, like you're focusing on your product first is is so important. Um, but a bread computer, huh? Okay, um, a bread so, computer so, for an IBM event. <laughs> So if, I, I mean, it's like, if that doesn't go exactly to plan, then, um, then you can always say that this is the first time that this has ever happened ever. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's still, I mean, that, it's still, sometimes you're sitting back and looking at it and be like, oh, I hope they don't notice that. Or I hope they don't notice this, but 99 to a hundred percent of the time, they're like, that was awesome. You yeah. know what I mean? Which, is, yeah, which it feels great. Yeah, they don't have the same expectations that we do, and and typically our our expectations are much much higher. Uh, this reminds me of a gig I did for Nokia one time, and we were just like, okay, well, let's. How do you produce a drink that's like really advanced technologically and interesting, um, and then oddly fall off the face of the earth uh, like Nokia did? Um, but, uh, <laughs> but for them, we ended up making a uh, um, a clarified daiquiri because I was like Booker and Dax had just opened. We were, everybody was getting wild about yeah. clarification, and so we made a stirred clear daiquiri um, by spinning it with kisasol and wine finings and and, um, and it was, separating a, it. Yeah. Yeah, that was such a fun learning experience. Um, I've never used that technique again. I just, it's just like, it's like Jurassic Park. It's like, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. <laughs> it, I, 
I feel like after this podcast, BlackBerry is going to call you up for a new campaign. <laughs> uh, my 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 door is always open to big tech clients <laughs> <laughs> that have all gone defunct. Yeah, right. Um, well, so so tell me um, about how um, how KG Fair came along. Like, uh, when did, when did you know that it was going to be like kind of catering events versus some other vertical in the F and B space? I just used a bunch of like did not. <laughs> it, it, it was second second child being born. Mm -hmm. not making enough money as a teacher, catering, cooking, bartending, and selling real estate all at the same time. And I said to myself, whichever one hits first, that's the one I'm going to focus on. So a little tidbit before that, before any of this, I started out as like a schlock house stockbroker before in 1999 out of college. I don't know what that means. Like a schlock house broker. You ever, so a schlock house Stockbroker is someone who sits on a phone all day and sells stocks to people in other countries. Like, so from four in the morning till four in the afternoon, I would call, you know, it's all math of numbers. It was like, you call 400 people a day, you get a hundred callbacks out of a hundred callbacks. You could close 10 accounts. So I'd say, Hey, Jason, how are you doing today? Do you invest <laughs> in the market? What would you say you invest in the market? I'm sitting here on wall street. And as a, you know, you should diversify your portfolio can I send you some information on myself and my company? And you'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, you, most of the people I dealt with were English. So they'd be like, yeah, you know, go ahead, send me something. I said, great. <laughs> so you'll receive something from me in two weeks. And if you're comfortable, would you be opening to listening to me pitch certain businesses that I think are going to do well to diversify your portfolio? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, we'd love to hear it. Literally, we'd never send out any information. Two days later, I'd call you back and I'd go, Jason. I know that you're waiting for my information, but right now something is happening in the American market that you have to hear about. Sun Microsystems is trading. Da, da, da. And you basically would sell them over the phone on hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the idea was you make them feel really small because we're on Wall Street and they should understand. And they'll send a, they were sending like forty to $60,000 to our accounts. And that's how I started out in sales. And did any of these ever appreciate? I mean, this is the Jordan Belson story. I mean, this is the Wolf of Wall it Street. It is, but we were doing real, real stocks. I can't name the company that I worked for because they might be yeah. in litigation. But, <laughs> but we were selling real stocks. It's just and, and so, I, get, so I mean, so they, they, they would some, some of them would some of them would appreciate in value, right? I mean, it wasn't just like just oh, dialing yeah. for dollars and okay, okay. Um, all right, yeah. No. I learned this is the reality of where I learned about sales, and if I'd only taken it sooner i was picture me like 20 years old in a sims remember that store sims where you could get two suits for like 125 bucks i still felt baggy clothes were cool so i bought my suits like 10 sizes too big i was wearing like baggy ass suits to the office mm -hmm. i was talking stockbroker talk but one thing i'll never forget and it's really important i think when you practice sales pitches that you never be afraid to go for it right because no one's ever going to just call you back and say, I want to buy. No one's ever going to, you, they'll uh, make everyone hang up on you. Have like have integrity, understand what you're doing, but go for it. Every stock goes up and down. It's not rocket science. If I sold you on a stock that goes down, likelihood is you're not going to buy my next one. But guess what? If I keep selling 50% of the people I sell to, the stock's going to go up. So mm -hmm. forget the bottom 50%, go for all the ones that are keep going up. Like there's always yeah. someone else to sell to, right? And you're not doing it out of the market. You just got to be in the market to make money. It's always going to make money. That's the history of our mm -hmm. country. Look at it right now. There's 40 million people unemployed and the market's still going up. It doesn't, it, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about politics. I like, you know, that seems to be our president's priority for sure. Um, wow. That's uh, that's crazy. I mean, like, the, like that's, kind of a mixture of like Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room, except for you were selling a real product that actually appreciated in value. So that's that's really interesting. I mean, it's like it's uh, the 400 calls a day is a lot. I mean, that's like, what, 30 seconds? Well, it teaches you how to work and hustle. Yeah. But on top of it, I think what it taught me was back then, I didn't have any access to Wall Street, even when I was selling it. I didn't have a computer. I only had a phone and a script. 
So hmm. I didn't feel connected to the product. I didn't feel connected to the stock market. I didn't feel connected to these companies. I didn't understand what Google was going to become or Amazon or any of these things because I was a kid. When I translated into catering, and I think the point of my story was, I feel much more comfortable selling something I have tangible access to, right? When I serve someone a drink, I know I made it. Mm -hmm. That's easier for me to sell the numbers on a screen. And I really fell in love with providing something to clients and watching them be excited and happy. And I think that the sales helped me, but now I was selling something like when I was in real estate and catering, I was like, which one's going to hit? Because I love the idea of walking someone through an apartment and saying, hey, did you check out this, you know, granite countertop? This was custom from Vermont. Like, mm -hmm. I love all, I love it all. But catering is what hit. And then I just really, you know, doubled down on it. And it, and it blew up on us. And like in 2008, we started our company and every year we doubled until like 2015 or 14. That's a lot of doubling. That's a, that's exponential well, maybe growth. Maybe it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> my math is probably not that good. It was what? It grew a first lot though. Year I mean, was 2008. And we started our company in October, two months. We'd only done like 20 grand. The next year we did like 50 grand. The next year we did like 300. And then all of a sudden we were in like the one to two millions and so on. And it, it's just something that you realize when you are building that and it's the same people calling you back, you must be bringing value. Yeah, totally. Um, how did you and your partner decide, uh, how did you and Peter decide who was going to do what in the, in the business? And how did you guys end up partnering up in the first place? <laughs> A lot of arguments. <laughs> we, we used to work for another company and that other company was a delight to work for, but a little bit weird when it came to like sharing money. <laughs> so they were a great company, but what happened was they were like, yeah, Josh, you are good at sales. You should do sales. Any sales you'll get commissions. And I went and did a ton of sales and I was like, can I have my commissions? And they were like, oh, you know, we didn't make as much as we thought. They started to backtrack and I just gotten them some pretty big accounts and I said, well, forget it then. Why don't we just do it ourselves? We did it ourselves. And um, I read a book. I was all into like business and learning and structures and procedures. And I read this book that seemed to suit me at the time, which was like, do what you're good at. Don't waste your time on anything that you're not good at. And I took that to mean sell. Like just, I love it. I love, I would... I read something that said, anytime you're afraid to do something, you better go do it. So I'd literally walk past stores the second I got my business card. And I would say, oh, if I walk in this store, they'll never take me seriously. Well, now I got to go in. You know, now I got to go in. And I used to have a pitch just like the stock market. I'd be like, hi, hey, my name's Josh. I'm one of the best chefs in New York. I run a catering company. And I'd love to give you free advice if you're having any event events coming up. I'll sit with you and plan them with you. And if you choose me to do them, I'll do an amazing job. And I would do it exactly like I did stockbroking. I would pick a neighborhood Soho, go to every store, find the store manager, give them that pitch. And I, every time I did it, someone was like, oh my God, we're planning something next week. Do you want to sit down with me right now? And I'd sit down and I'd plan the event. And that was how we got started. That's hustle right there. And that's diligence. And that's just being relentless. Um, and, I, and, I, and I love that about you. Um, a lot of people think that um, they, you know, you just start a business and then that's it. But um, uh, still, another another large group of people have a very hard time telling people what it is that they do and and providing value in advance. So it's like you know, uh, you know, going back to Gary Vee, he's like, give, 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 ask. You know, he's you know, he's, he's yeah, yeah. like, you were pro you were providing value immediately, and it didn't really take a whole lot of time or effort. It just took the kind of courage to to introduce yourself to a, to a new person and say, this is what I do. Um, you know, yeah. people think that they, people think that there's a huge barrier to entry to um, to starting a business, but there really isn't. It's just it's, it's fear is the biggest one. Yeah. Once um, you sit with someone and you help them plan their event and you show them ways they can save money or be creative, you're, you've already brought the value, right? You've already, you know, you've already made them see that they just saved a thousand dollars by sitting with you and you lost nothing by sitting with them. Right. And now you have to, now you just have to execute because they've given you the job and you just can't screw it up. 
So when you start, so when you started out, did you, um, did you ever have your own kitchen or did you, um, did you always rent a kitchen? So how does that work? We started in my parents' apartment cooking. (laughs) We would do tastings in like in my parents, like a a kitchen because it was nicer than my kitchen. We would do everything out of an apartment, which is not really legal. So don't get me on that. And then we got our insurance up. I mean, for the first two years, I mean, you don't even know that you're meant to do certain things when you're doing it on such a small scale. And as we're speaking about, I was a teacher. My business partner had an acting gig, right? So we were just like, oh, this is great. We're getting events. Oh, shoot. Now we're a business. We're making a certain amount of money. We need insurance to get in this building for this job. And that's the only way you find out is like, hey, I'm here to do the job. And they're like, yeah, but you don't have a COI. What? What's that? Oh shit! I gotta get a COI. <laughs> Calling yeah, insurance there. people for an hour, and then you pay them a fee, and then you get it. And now we're like, you know, now we have the best, you know, insurance in the business. We can walk into any building in New York because we know the game. But that, those are the barriers to entry that you either are gonna put your tail between your legs and go home and cry, or you're gonna figure out a way to get it done. Right? I See, can't tell you how many uh, times we snuck into buildings to get it done until we were right, or like. I'm still sneaking into buildings. I'm not, there's <laughs> nothing that will stop me once someone is paid to make their event occur. We've never had an event cancel. Huh. Like, well, like until recently. We oh, yeah. well, like that. Yes. Yeah. Then, you know, up until then, I was sneaking into buildings and giving my card out to people. Like, I'm just always <laughs> hungry. Wow, that's crazy. When you get insurance and you, when you get like, um, you know, certifications and all these other things that, that d- businesses typically need, a lot of people don't see them as being assets for the business where they're, they're like, OK, well, if you already ha- if you've jumped through this hoop to service this one piece of business, then you can also make that more valuable as an asset to other people. So you can tear up from that piece of uh, from that piece of uh, from that hoop you had to jump through. Like, you know, we we're talking about ins- like COIs and stuff like that. If you have liability insurance, if you have like umbrella insurance, um, then that qualifies you to work in a whole different level of business. And and I think that a lot of people are, are worried about that. Like, oh, well, I have to spend this money. Well, make it the most value possible. Like book another client that um, that appreciates that and requires that. Um, but I love that story. I mean- like, that's that's 100 percent how we built our business, because once I had that insurance and we were paying for it, I mean, we must pay over twenty thousand dollars a year in just paper insurance that we've never used. Mm-hmm. And Thankfully. once we had pieces of it, it was like, I can now get in this building. I'm going for it. Like, I'm going to get more business. And my start off pitch is going to be I can come in this building because we're totally covered. Your building gave us the sign off. So now you look at the D and D building or any of those fancy showroom buildings. They do. They do, used to do tons of events. Once you've got the insurance, go to every showroom in that building and be like, "The building's approved me. I'd love to share what I do." You know, and I spent days just scouring those buildings for parties and saying, "Hey, look." We may not be the best fit for you, but even if you let me bring you a proposal and plan with you, you can now take that proposal back to the person you work with and you can probably get a discount because you can be like, hey, I met this guy. He's great. So I I used to basically trick them into using me as a decoy to lower other other bids and then I'd be in the door with them. You know what I mean? I was a sneaky bastard. I think That's pretty the, sneaky. First time I worked, the first time I worked with a company like yours or even someone I needed to do some liquor license thing. And I didn't actually have one. The very first time I needed to get a liquor license for an event, I didn't have one. And I did some crazy workaround that no one even knew about. And I got the liquor (laughs) license done. And then I was like, Ooh, liquor licenses. This is an interesting business. You can make money off of these things. I need to get one. You know what I mean? That's that's actually how we, yeah, that's that's how we met actually. Yeah, because because we were both doing the um, the Jack Motel, I think was the first big gig that we did together. And then after that, um, people would need a la carte licenses for something, and you're the guy to go to for that. Like, so you know, you're just like you need a license, okay? Give me you know, ideally two weeks, and 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 it's NFV, and it's like you have a liquor license for your event because it's a sub of your liquor license. And um, you know, again, a lot of people don't see those as being like retailable assets. 
Um, so you gotta you gotta take take inventory I, of your shit and find out what you can sell. <laughs> and then sell yeah, it. no, back in the back in the glory days of licensing and all these big events when Jack Daniels and all those Dosakis and everyone was doing these really cool big events. I think you know in a year, I think I I I look under my tab in QuickBooks and I think one year it was like fifty six thousand dollars in licensing, like so. Yeah, you know, and that yeah, which is cost you. Four thousand bucks. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, that's 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 not nothing. That's not nothing. Um, you know, like it's just like it's just like there's. I I feel the same way about pieces of software. Like I'm a I'm a nut for for buying lifetime licenses for young fledgling pieces of software because I use a, a company called AppSumo and they um they sell you lifetime licenses to pieces of software that are you know do very specific things um, and. The, the the real value in them is not that what the what the thing that it not what it does right now but what it does in the future and how you can kind of leverage that into either a new a new skill a new capability or a new value for a client um i just wish people would get their heads around that this is a hustle life is a hustle you may be listening to this and and think like these guys are like these guys are not like me but chances are you work for somebody like us <laughs> and, That's, yeah and the path to wealth is and the path to independence is going to be, you know, figuring this shit out for yourself. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I just I, I love it. No, I was going to say also just think thinking wisely. I think of like I listened to something you did a few weeks ago with uh, bartenders and and essentially like finances. And I think mm -hmm. that all like a basic principle, like spending less than you make and living it a little bit rough when you have to like and saving and having money work for you having systems work for you having everything work in your favor starts you on this 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 upward trend and i don't think life just goes up you know life is very rocky but there are just some kick ass years like in a row when you're getting when you're just not afraid to to fail and you just are pushing and pushing and pushing and even Failures are wins, right? Like when I fail at something, I really won because I learned something. And like, there's just this mentality of like winning that feels really good when you're on that uphill so that when you do hit those downhills, you're not, you've, you've prepared and like you're, you're ready to weather the storm. And that this is a big storm we're in, but like, I'm, I, I'm prepared to a degree. Right. Like financially, which is a big piece for a person who has three kids, you know, one's already gone to college. The other one's about to go to college. And look, look at me. I'm a mess. Like and I'm feeling OK. And it's because I always spent less and I always invested and I always took the time to to realize what's important to me. Like things are not that important to me. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Um, and I've, uh, I mean, without oversimplifying it, I've always, I've kind of narrowed it down to like, there's basically two kinds of people in the world. There's like producers and consumers and neither one is not better than the other. You know, some people are perfectly happy being, you know, working for other people, consuming things and just kind of taking the, the path, the safe path. Uh, you know, the safe path is absolutely get a job with the, with the salary, go, go to school before that to qualify you for this job. And that puts you on the path to having a, like a, a safe and steady retirement. Um, other people are like the makers, the producers that, um, that are the ones taking risks. They're starting businesses. They're comfortable living with less because they kind of, I, they can identify this kind of consumer cycle. Um, and you're either, you're a slave to that, like either you're working for that consumer cycle or you're creating that consumer cycle. And it's like one side, you can get rich one side, you can get broke. Um, and the, the other side is just, you know, pretty much with a reasonable degree of certainty, how it's going to go. And, um, and again, like, I'm not trying to make a value judgment one way or the other, but it's, um, you know, you and I are the kind of people that are just like, you know what, fuck it. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, yeah, I, what I struggle with right now is, is having the bandwidth to appreciate the things that I already have. And so it's like, I'm not actively looking for more stuff. I'm actively looking to make more stuff, to make something, to create something that somebody else can have. Um, because it's like, I feel like the, the more stuff you have, the harder it is to appreciate it. And, um, 
you know, fundamentally, like as part of my nature, I can't imagine um, just living to acquire things because that's more shit that you have to move someday. That's more shit that you have to <laughs> maintain or clean or, you know, I'm just like, yeah. I, I wear the same shit every single day of my life. I don't, I don't, I don't change. I don't ve- deviate one little bit from the, from the clothes that I wear, from my morning routine. Um, you know, I'm very, very regimented and, de- and, and oriented towards, um, you know, having very good continuity, you know, my wife has a real job, you know? And so it's like, I'm actually really grateful that, that we, that she has that kind of, um, that stability because I'm, I'm like a roller coaster, man. Some days, some, some days it's great. Some days it's crazy. How's it but like, you love I mean, it. so like, but I love it. Yeah, no, I can't imagine doing anything yeah. else. I can't imagine ever working for anybody else. It's just, it's just not something that is just not part of my DNA. Well, um, but I'm super, whole like, podcast but, is, go ahead. I was going to say this whole podcast will end up being like a, a Gary V, uh, like homage to Gary V. I would never say that he's eloquent, but sometimes he says shit in the easiest way. And what you just said is like, there are people who are born to be entrepreneurs. They'll go without eating. They'll go without, you know, because they love it. And then there are those that, and it's not a judgment call. If you like going to work nine to five and then checking out and going home and doing the things you like to do, God bless your soul. Like, I wish sometimes I could turn it off. I can't like, I can never turn it off. I'm always like, Oh man, this person just did that. I think I could make that. You know what I mean? And if I could make that, then I could sell it to people like that. You know what I mean? My mind's always working like that. And I wish I could turn it off. Sometimes it's been the cause of many a problem in my marriage. Um, but yeah, been there. like you said, <laughs> like you said, there's and and this situation is a, is is absolutely horrible. But if, you know, Gary V has been saying for a long time, the last 10 years have just been like home run hits for everyone. You know, you could be Mm. an idiot and come out of school and be like, I've been thinking about doing a social media app and you could get $5 million from some VC for it. And they'd be like, I love you kid. You're cute on Instagram. You take the 5 million and roll with it. And that's what it's felt like to me for the last 10 years. And now it's not going to be that way. So all the people who are fakers maybe not fakers because no one's faking it but maybe the people that can't go without eating or can't go with less those are the people that they can take that nine to five you know as long as you show up to work on time you'll always have a job in my book right half of the reason i ever got a job in my life was because i was never late and i just showed up right it sounds horrible but like if i show up to work and i'm never late and i do what i'm told like I could always have a job, right? It's just, I didn't necessarily want that for my life. So um, tell me, what are your aspirations for KG Fair? Like, where do you see, uh, where do you see that business going in, in the next five, 10 years? I have been listening to a lot of podcasts. This is the first one I've ever been on. So thank you for allowing me to be on one. I hope I haven't screwed it up by talking way too much and way too fast. But No, I mean, I you're stalling now, it. but... <laughs> I, I was listening to Tim Ferriss podcast a while back where he was talking to this restaurateur and they talked about like Danny Meyer and I hate to be like a fanboy, but when I heard Danny Meyer's mission, I was like, that's my mission. He stole my mission, right? His mission essentially for all of his spots was like, you've got to make people feel important, right? Everything you do. I'm a social person. I love being around people. And I think that being around people means understanding what makes them feel special. Someone may feel special because they need you to treat them like they're Kardashian and someone else may feel special because they need a little space. They need a little bit more time. They need a little more delicate touch. You know, they don't need all the flair. And I think it's my job in hospitality and with KG fair to understand with every event, what the client wants. And then within that event as a microcosm of the event, Every person is their mini event, right? Hospitality goes the next step. It's like, what does the client want to get out of this event? And then what does that individual guest want to get out of that client's experience? Some people don't want to be shoved into the photo booth and do something crazy. And as a hospitality expert, I've got to know when I'm pushing and when, and when to really understand. So something as simple as just making sure KG Fair always treats people in the way they want to be treated and that they come away from that event feeling as if, wow, that bartender remembered my drink. It was a 500 person event, which we probably won't get back to until like 2032. But even in a 50 person, <laughs> hopefully, event, hopefully sooner right, than that. Fine. 
but like you want to feel special. You want to know that the people there don't want to be anywhere else. And oftentimes in catering, it's like cater waiters. It's like, how much are you going to pay me? I only do bar. I only do this. Like I want to get away from that or catering companies may only hire males or they may only hire people over six feet. I really respect clients views and visions for their event, but I do truly believe that good people who want to be at work and care about being in a place and serving people is what always reads through at an event. When someone takes care of you and makes you feel like they cared about what happened and they told you about the food or they went to the chef and say, Hey chef, someone has a peanut allergy. Can you, you know, maybe make a little plate for them. And you do that in an event for a hundred people. It goes an incredibly long way and you can't teach that you can train it and you can have expectations, but you can't watch over all of your staff all the time. So I really look for people who care about being there and they don't have a better place to be. Right. Like I hate the waiters who are like, dude, I was going to get X amount of dollars on your event, but someone offered me $2 more on this event. Sorry, I can't make it. Like that to me is like, well, where's your integrity? Like I've always looked out for my staff. I've always looked out for my clients, right? Like be a part of something, like have some, you know, real value to what you do. I know you don't want to be a cater waiter forever, but when you invest in people, you become part of this family. And that family is a pretty cool family to be a part of. That was uh, really powerful. Um, the The part that stuck out to me uh, that, that I would love to touch on is that you said that I am a hospitality expert. Um, when people say uh, people have a hard time identifying what they're extremely good at, and I think that that's a major limitation, and that they have a hard time expressing how good they are at something. And it is okay to be an expert. You don't have to be the expert of the universe. You can be a, a specialist and an expert in your field, but it's important that you're able to say that to somebody. You say, hey, listen, I'm an expert in X, Y, or Z. And you can put that on your business card. You can make a website out of that. But it's like, that's how you, that's the difference between, you know, being able to communicate what your services are um, to new people. And I I just think that that's incredibly important. I mean, obviously the part about, you know, working with your company means being part of something, part of of a family. That's also really huge. But um, what stuck out to me was just like, you know, just saying it plainly and simply, I'm an expert in this. And uh, that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're only an expert in only that. I mean, it means you can, you can be an expert in many things, but um, I just thought that was really important to note. How long did it, like, where did you, like, how long have you said that before? I mean, do you talk about the, that, that very often? I, since I've been, I think when you're in a craft, you need to spend time and energy on it. You can't, it's like, you can't just be an influencer. Like I always thought you could just be an influencer. No, it takes a freaking ton of work and effort to become an influencer. I don't want any part of that. Like that's a crazy amount of work and self expression and putting yourself out there. That's hard for me. But when I got into catering and hospitality, you've got to, you've got to look at the greats. You've got to read their books. You've got to take notes or watch their videos. You've kind of got to, and you've got to do it, right? What was that book? What is it? Like uh, some Malcolm Gladwell book where if you do something for 10,000 hours or more, you become an, an essentially an expert at it. So like I'm at every one of my events. I'm talking to my clients afterwards. I'm saying, what can go better next time? What can we do differently to make sure? I'm talking to people and saying, how did that feel to you? Um, I'm reading people's social like body uh like the way that they're interacting. I'm reading all of these situations because it's important to me. And I think when something's important to you, you do the work necessary to figure out how to, how to get better at it. And it, and I think that it, as hokey as it, not hokey because it's not the right word, but as, as fundamental as that is in American culture, when you're making money and repeat business, that's kind of share, sharing that, I'm on the right track, right? When someone calls me back and says, I loved the last event, there's a few things that I'd like different on the next one. To me, that is the greatest gift. Yes, there's always something to work on, but you didn't just fire me and go to someone else. You said, Josh, these are the amazing things. This is why I love working with you. Next time, can we change this? Because that didn't feel right, right? That to me is the greatest gift because now we get to work together on the next one rather than just kind of like, eh, it's done. You're not right for me. I, they know that I went 
all the way and I brought value. And they're comfortable enough with me to tell me what tweaks they need, right? Like, well, it needs uh, to come out faster. Yeah, I mean, and shit happens too. And it's like the, the better relationship you have with your client, the better, um, the better you're, you're able to respond to problems. And a big problem for them is having to research and find somebody else to do it. So, you know, yeah. you're doing everybody, you're doing everybody a, a service by, by being good at, by being good at the thing that is that you sold <laughs> you know, by being yeah. a good caterer, being a good event producer. Um, all right, man. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, I know awesome. quarantine quarantine time is relative, um, but um, it has been a delight to uh, learn more about your business. And um, how would we find you on social medias? Uh, you would find us. Well, first, thank you for having me. This was my first one. I promise I'll get better. It's going to be like a good client relationship. You'll call me afterwards and tell me what I can do better next time, where to slow down and, and maybe look up a few of the definitions of the words I pretend to use. But you can find us on Instagram and on the website at KG Fair, uh, K-G-F-A-R-E, uh, kgfair.com. We are also creating some programs uh, for drinks called Stirrup. But yeah, kgfair.com. And my personal one is Drink Drink King NYC. That's always a fun one to see all the bread baking. Right now I'm doing a slow-cooked pulled pork. And I just, for my kids tonight, and I also just made the best hot sauce in the entire world thanks to my personal BFF, James Kent from uh, the Crown Shy Restaurant, best restaurant in New York, voted best restaurant. And I think Tales, uh, uh, the cocktail, Tales of the Cocktail just voted them the best bar in, in America, or top 10. So they're amazing, Harrison Ginsburg and all those guys. Check it out. Yeah, what's it? They just got in the top 10 bar in America this year as voted by Tales of the Cocktail. So that the best chef in the entire world, James Kent, shared with me secretly the recipe to his chicken hot sauce that is amazing. Yet the fucker didn't tell me it took seven days to ferment all the peppers. So I've been waiting <laughs> seven fucking days to make it. And I finally had it done yesterday. So I'm making the crown shy hot sauce with mayo. So it's going to be like a hot sauce mayo sriracha thing on pulled pork with uh, some homemade uh, coleslaw for the kids on little homemade brioche buns. That's ridiculous. That's uh, that's some next level shit. All right. Well, thanks again, Josh. And um, I look forward to talking to you very soon. Thanks a lot, brother. Well, in case you missed it, uh, there was an enormous amount of extremely actionable advice in there. This is probably one of the densest shows we've ever done because Josh has so much to offer as far as advice for entrepreneurs. And as he said after the show, if he can do it, anybody can do it. Hopefully you find a lot of inspiration from his story because it is a story of humble beginnings. He and his partner have grown a multi-million dollar business by being relentless, extremely good at their jobs, and entirely focused on quality. So I hope you enjoyed this episode with Josh Griffiths from KG Fair. Be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary of the show and links to all the stuff that we talked about. And a special thanks to Danny Messina for editing and post-producing this show. If you like the show, you might enjoy another project we started called The Industry Distilled with Duff and Luttrell. We read the spirits industry news so you don't have to. We go live on Thursdays on Facebook, or you can head to www.industrydistilled.com for updates. I like to keep these shows as short and dense as possible, uh, but if you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please be sure to reach out to me at Jason Luttrell on Twitter and Instagram, or search for Jason Luttrell on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing the show with another person. Just hit the little prong button and it shoot it out to a friend. If you love the show, please hit the subscribe button, leave a rating, review, or comment on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, iHeartRadio, or just about wherever you get your podcasts. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time on The Latrell Show.